All right, it's 9 a.m. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire de la Calle, UCSF PGY5, uh, and it's my great honor to present to you today Dr. Mark Litwin. He is professor and chair of the UCLA Urology and is going to talk to us about everything we need to know uh, regarding testicular cancer, and I'll help moderate questions at the end. Dr. Litwin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone uh, uh, watching. Well, I'm going to jump right in so we have plenty of time to cover the information that I want to cover and then leave time for questions and answers toward the end of our, of our session. Um, I start out by acknowledging the help I have with this slide set from uh, three of my urologic oncology fellows here at UCLA listed on the slide, as well as the fact that this slide set is based at least loosely on the AUA core curriculum slide set, which is available for free download that goes along with the AUA core, core curriculum. Um, I have no disclosures. <clears throat> any talk about any cancer is complete only by beginning with a discussion of its incidence, prevalence, and some of the basics on its epidemiology. Uh, this uh, chart here shows the ethnic racial breakdown of testicular cancer incidence in the United States. And what is most striking about it is that like many of the other cancer cancers that we deal with in urology, there is a significant racial disparity. However, unlike most of the other cancers that we deal with in all of human oncology, um, black patients are much less affected. Um, this is a disease that is primarily one affecting white patients and to some extent Latino patients, but it is a disease that is almost, almost vanishingly rare in African Americans uh, and indeed in people of African ancestry around the, around the globe. You see, of course, here the peak incidence, which I think is familiar to everyone in that it is a cancer, unlike many others, which affects young adults. <clears throat> the most common age group is between 20 and 40, uh, and you see what the uh, peak incidence is here, somewhere in the late 20s, early 30s, and there, there's a, a variation in, in that based on the histology, which we'll talk about in a bit. <clears throat> a bit more now about epidemiology and a little, bit, a little bit about screening. Testicular cancer is uncommon. It represents only about 1% of cancers across, the, across the, the globe, but its incidence has been rising over the last 40 years. And we don't think that it is an issue of detection increases as we've seen in prostate cancer during the PSA era. No one knows exactly why this is, but there is certainly a, an in, increase in the incidence that has been noted over the last several decades. In the United States, uh, in the current year, there are just under 10,000 new cases projected to be diagnosed with 440 deaths in the, in the United States. It is uh, widely known that cryptorchidism or undescended testicle is associated with uh, the incidence of testicular cancer. In fact, 10% of men uh, with testicular cancer have this history. Um, it is, it is uh, widely quoted that the increase in risk uh, in, in someone who has a history of cryptorchidism is somewhere between two and six fold, and those numbers uh, even vary more greatly depending on who, on who you read. There is some kind of genetic uh, preponderance um, in that patients with a first degree relative that is a father or a brother with a history of testicular cancer are at increased risk. If your father has it, it's about a four fold increased risk, and if you have a brother with testicular cancer, it's about a nine fold increased risk. Infertility or a history of infertility is also associated with an increased risk of various types of testicular cancer. And you see here from one and a half to three fold increase in, in, in risk. In infertility, is, it is not known whether this is a detection bias or not because of the increased attention on the testicles um, during infertility workups. One thing that I think is important to specify is that microlithiasis, and you see a picture of it here, is actually not thought to be associated with an increased risk of testicular cancer. Um, <clears throat> historically, patients who were diagnosed incidentally with testicular microlithiasis were followed for many years, usually with ultrasound. Um, and then some of the larger studies showing this come from the, uh, the military, the US military. But in fact, there's not shown to be a statistically significantly increased risk in men who have microlithiasis. And therefore, when we make this diagnosis, incidentally, we don't advise any particular follow-up. Um, history of uh, genetic testicular dis, uh, uh, abnormalities such as uh, gonadal dysgenesis, Klinefelter syndrome, and some studies Down syndrome actually are associated with increased risk. And as I mentioned before, intratubular germ cell neoplasia, which is often associated with infertility, 
also are associated with increased risk. Historically, HIV diagnosis was associated with an increased risk in seminoma. We don't see much of that anymore because the effect is, is, is mitigated by the use of retrovirals, which everybody is on. Um, and then finally, on the issue of screening, um, like many of our diseases in urology, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, based on the evidence that's available, recommends against routine screening in asymptomatic men. Having said that, we certainly in urology do a fair amount of, uh, of uh, uh, advice to patients to do early detection through testicular self-examination. The basic subtypes of testicular cancer, I think, are familiar to most people in urology, and we classify those either as seminomas or non-seminomas. A classic seminoma is the most common germ cell tumor, peak incidence a little bit older in the age group that we're talking about, and a small percentage of them, of them histologically contain syncytiotrophoblasts, which thus results in the production of a little bit of HCG um, in about that percentage of patients. And the classic seminoma is thought to arise um, oncologically from uh, intratubular germ cell neoplasia and hence the association with, uh, with infertility, which can often uh, present um, in this age group as well. <clears throat> Spermatocytic seminoma is relatively uncommon and has a peak incidence in men older in life. Um, and then non-seminomatous germ cell carcinomas, which includes the four subtypes you see listed here, plus any of those subtypes uh, included with seminoma. Uh, we classify as a non-seminoma. So a patient who has 90% seminoma and 10% embryonal carcinoma is managed as a non-seminoma, even though he has more significant percentage of, of seminoma. Um, the slide set, this, this particular slide is available on the uh, AUA core curriculum slide set, and so you can, and, uh, you can uh, go to it to capture some of this information on this uh, pretty dense slide. In general, embryonal carcinoma, choreal carcinoma are the ones we worry about the most in terms of uh, mortality, but teratoma can also be very, very fatal as well. We'll talk about that later in the, in the hour. Um, clinical presentation. I think as everybody knows, uh, testicular cancer patients generally present with a painless mass. Um, it's important to try and discern whether the mass is a testicular mass or whether it's a scrotal mass. And patients typically don't know the difference and will present with a quote-unquote testicular mass and end up having something like a varicocele, which is familiar to many of us, a spermatocele, which is a cystic structure adjacent to the testicle, sometimes a cord lipoma that traverses the, the ring and goes down into the, into the scrotum, like you see here. And of course, probably the most common is just simply a hydrocele. Um, which can be concerning to patients. However, uh, testicular cancers, as you see on the bottom row here, also uh, can be easily identified by ultrasound, and it is a pretty unambiguous diagnosis when one of these is seen. It either occurs as a mass right in the center of the testicle like this, sometimes with shadowing or calcification, sometimes it's isoechoic, um, but it is separate, separated by some kind of a capsule here. Other times it's a bit more geographic or geometric, like this, um, and so uh, you know you see all different types. But a scrotal ultrasound generally is considered the principal element in the in the in the workup that extends the physical examination. Historically, before before ultrasound was widely available, we took patients to the operating room just based on a on a, on a physical examination. But today, everyone gets an ultrasound if that's possible. Um, <clears throat> another important uh, item in the uh, initial workup is uh, the measurement of serum tumor markers. These are the three that are, that are typically measured, alpha beta protein, the beta subunit of human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, and then LDH or lactate dehydrogenase, which is a more generic marker of, 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 of bulk of disease burden. AFP and HCG are the workhorses in terms of serum tumor markers, as is familiar to most people. The half-life being different between those two, five to seven days for AFP and much shorter for HCG. And this helps us in calculating uh, um, whether the patient is thought to be cured or not after he undergoes orchiectomy, because you calculate based on the half-life whether the marker is descending towards normal at a normal rate, at the expected rate, or if it's not. And this is, is a very key information in trying to determine at the base, at baseline whether the patient is likely to have metastatic disease. Initial treatment, uh, radical inguinal orchiectomy, not a scrotal orchiectomy. Inguinal orchiectomy is, uh, again, I think familiar to most people in urology. It involves removal of not only the testicle, but also the spermatic cord up to the internal inguinal ring. It's done through an inguinal incision, not a scrotal incision. 
And the reason for the inguinal approach, at least historically, is that it allows us to remove the spermatic cord all the way up to the internal ring, so that if we are back doing a retroperitoneal mode dissection later, we can remove the remainder of the cord down to the internal ring uh, from inside the abdomen, either open or, or laparoscopically. It is also thought to be, at least historically, the appropriate management for a patient with testicular cancer because the lymphatic drainage of the testicle is fairly reliably up the spermatic cord along the spermatic vessels to the retroperitoneum, um, either interaortic cable or paraaortic, as we'll see in a bit, um, and not to the inguinal lymph nodes or the groin lymph nodes. And this predictability of the lymphatic spread, the patterns of lymphatic spread, make the disease fairly easy to predict in terms of where, the, where, where you go to look for tumor and then where you treat in terms of tumor that might be, might be metastatic. It is believed that a transscrotal orchiectomy or even a biopsy shouldn't be performed because it, uh, at least theoretically, cross-fertilizes the scrotal lymphatics, which go to the groins and the iliacs, with the testicular lymphatics, which go up to the retroperitoneum. Um, and this is really more historical than something that's been shown in a, in a, in a, in a randomized trial, but it is generally accepted as, as a, a truism in, in neurologic oncology. Testicular sparing surgery in general is not recommended. Occasionally, a patient who has a solitary testicle, having lost the first one, either from trauma or torsion or cryptorganism earlier in life, uh, this is someone in whom this might be considered, um, but be very, very careful. Be very, very careful with this. Um, initial clinical staging um, involved the following items. Of course, the primary pathology from the tumor that has been removed, uh, the, uh, the imaging of the, uh, of the areas where the tumor is thought to spread. Typically, this involves a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis with contrast. Um, historically, we would get an abdominal pelvic CT scan and a chest x-ray. Um, however, if the abdominal pelvic CT scan were positive, then we do cross-sectional imaging of the chest. And so it saves the patient a trip back to the, to the uh, CT suite. And with uh, increased attention to uh, radi uh, radiation exposure today, it's generally considered safe. And most oncologists will tell you that they prefer a CT of the chest in addition to the abdomen and the pelvis. If there is disease in the chest, then we image the brain as well. If not, then we don't. Uh, post orchiectomy markers are always measured. <clears throat> um, typically, we skip this if the baseline markers were, were normal, um, but occasionally you will see markers rise from normal to abnormal uh, uh, in, in a patient after orchiectomy, and so we generally measure them as well. <clears throat> At the very least, a patient who presents with elevated markers pre orchiectomy should have them measured weekly until they normalize or until they fail to normalize, and that informs the subsequent uh, treatment decision making. Um, one of the things that I teach our residents uh, here at UCLA is the critical importance of the pre-orchiectomy markers being drawn pre-orchiectomy. And I insist that in the OR, while we're waiting for the patient to go to sleep, we log on to the computer and double check, triple check, quadruple check that the orchiectomy mark, that the uh, uh, testicular markers have been drawn prior to the orchiectomy. You have up until the moment that you clamp the cord to actually draw them. So occasionally it gets missed because someone forgets about it. Um, and we'll have anesthesia drawn at that time. The retroperitoneum is the primary site of metastasis in the majority of cases, which is why we image that, that area. Also, I think familiar to most people um, is that along with the anatomic differences between the, the venous drainage of the left and right testicles, the lymphatic drainage goes along with them, and this allows uh, us to predict pretty accurately where the retroperitoneal nets are gonna be, um, if there are gonna be any. The normal lymphatic flow goes from right to left in the retroperitoneum, and so a right-sided primary tends to go up to the inner aorta cable region, um, paracable region, and then traverse over to the left side, whereas a left-sided primary tumor tends to metastasize to the paraaortic nodes on the left and not go over to the right. Um, these are not absolute rules, but that's a general, a general guideline. Uh, the exception to this pattern of spread is choriocarcinoma, which is well known to spread hematogenously, um, including not infrequently to the, to the brain. So a choreo primary, a choreo, pure choreo primary or a predominant choreo primary will image the brain as well, in addition to the cross-sectional imaging of the chest abdomen and pelvis. Um, <clears throat> the uh, initial clinical staging uh, is based on the TNM system, as you see here. Again, this slide I realize is somewhat dense. It's available on the AUA slide set if you want to grab it or it's available a lot of different places. Um, 
but the TNM uh, clinical staging system also uses an S at the end based on whether the markers are elevated and if so, how high. And it's various um, uh, uh, numbers for the uh, AFP, the HCG, or the LDH. Probably the most important thing at the initial staging point is whether the primary tumor is a T1 or a T2. It's very rare to see a T3 or a T4 tumor. Um, we rarely see T0s, although we can come back to that later. Uh, TIS refers to uh, ITGCN, which is often diagnosed as part of an infertility workup. But we're generally looking at whether the tumor is a T1 or a T2. Uh, T1s can be divided into A and B. I don't find much use for that. It's based on their size. But we mainly are looking to see if there's lymphovascular invasion or involvement of the tunica vaginalis in the primary, because even if the CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis are, are negative, a PT2 tumor, a clinical T2 tumor, has a much higher risk of, uh, of um, causing occult micrometastatic uh, disease in the, in the retro peritoneum, and that needs to be brought into the, the, uh, the, the, the management decisions. Um, <clears throat> this is another version of the same, and you can see here uh, that it also kind of hews back to the old staging system, Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three. And, and many, many people, even those of us who use the TNM system, like to use the uh, Roman numeral one, two, and three system because it just helps us in a, in a, in a quick sec recognize what type of uh, uh, stage the patient has. This slide also um, is fairly dense, but it's available on the, uh, on the, uh, on the corporate web slide set. Um, I'm not gonna say a whole lot during this hour about the management of patients with advanced disease, a little bit, but not a, a whole lot, other than to say um, the following. When patients are diagnosed with uh, advanced disease, i.e. metastatic disease, again, typically to the retroperitoneum, sometimes to the chest, but also sometimes to visceral organs as well, the tumors are classified based on this uh, international work group uh, uh, stratification as good, intermediate, or poor prognosis. Um, and you can see here you know, how patients are broken down. Seminomas in general are better prognosis than non-seminomas, although they're all excellent. Um, but so much so that there is no such thing as a poor risk seminoma. There's no such thing as a poor risk seminoma, even a patient who has visceral metastatic disease. Um, and so that's important to recognize. But the medical oncologists use this stratification to help guide their choices on initial chemotherapy for metastatic disease, whether they're going to use the basic glio, etoposide, and platinum that I'll mention a little bit later, or whether they're going to go to a more salvagey type of a, a regimen right out, right out the gate. Um, as you see here, the, the serum tumor markers are one of the main things that ends up uh, putting patients into this good, intermediate, or poor risk uh, category. Um, so, management of the patient with uh, stage one pure seminoma. And by stage one, I mean clinical stage one, the patient has had a radical orchiectomy and he's had uh, imaging of his abdomen and pelvis and his chest and his, his imaging of the abdomen, pelvis and chest are negative. And if he had a small increase in his HCG as some uh, seminoma patients do, that has normalized. Well, about 80% of those men are cured already when you see them back for their post-op visit. So all the rest of this discussion is ultimately academically a moot point. But of course, you don't know that when you're counseling the patient. And so we give them this counseling. In general, the approach in the United States is a little bit more aggressive and has been so than it is in Western Europe and, and other places around the world where surveillance is, is more preferred, even in Canada where it's more preferred there. But historically, in this country, we gave patients option number two, which is radiation therapy in a so-called hockey stick uh, uh, format along the, retro, retro, along the retroperitoneum midline and then hockey sticking down, if you will, on the side of the, of the tumor, ipsilateral to the tumor, and they would get 20 gray over two weeks with a variety of sort of mild to moderate complications, some concern over long-term complications. But then about going on 20 years or so ago now, there was a series of randomized controlled trials of radiation therapy versus single-dose carboplatinum. Um, and the, the, the uh, carboplatinum one in terms of uh, equivalent uh, cure rates with a decreased uh, risk of uh, morbidity. And so generally patients um, in, in the United States at least are managed with one cycle of, uh, of uh, carbo, uh, typically done not with a port, but simply a one day infusion. Some of the oncologists will do two cycles or two doses of, of carbo. So it's two single dose carbos, if you will, 
Um, and that really has become the standard of care. You see that the relapse rates here for clinical stage one seminoma are extraordinarily low um, and even lower after, after two cycles. Um, the wildly popular approach, though, to managing patients with pure uh, clinical stage one seminoma really has been active, active surveillance. Um, <clears throat> active surveillance is perfectly acceptable if, uh, as the guideline says, if the patient is appropriate and can agree to comply with the follow-up regimen. Um, the challenge with this is that this is a, what I would call a demographically risky group. Um, and because of the demographic nature of who we're dealing with, and I have a slide on this toward the end of the presentation, um, it is more risky um, in that patients are unlikely overall to comply with the full course of fo follow-up regimen, the surveillance regimen. But the odds are good, the odds are in their favor because 80% are cured um, with, with, uh, with orchiectomy. Um, despite this, um, if and when those 20% recur, uh, virtually all of them can be salvaged with, uh, with chemotherapy. So it's very uncommon to die from metastatic seminoma. It's not impossible, but very, very uncommon. Um, <clears throat> the active surveillance regimen, um, as you see here, um, this is per the NCCN, which is also available uh, publicly, is fairly intense um, over, the, over the course of the first five years. Generally, we don't follow patients beyond that, although there are cases of, of seminoma that relapse later. Um, and so many people, particularly at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they do manage them with follow-ups for almost lifelong, really. Again, the most common site of relapse is the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. And again, a very, very high overall survival in patients because so many of them can be salvaged effectively with, uh, with um, bleomycin, etoposide, and platinum, uh, or even etoposide and platinum alone if they recur at some point during the surveillance period. Okay. That's seminoma. Now let's switch to the management of the patient with a stage one non-seminoma, that's germ cell tumor, non-seminoma. Um, this is a little bit more tricky because of the, the, the risks. Um, unlike seminomas, only about 70% of patients are cured with orchiectomy. And so it's counterintuitive when sitting down with the patient and his family at the post-op visit to explain to him that although his tumor was well-contained in the testicle, it had whatever histology you report out that makes it a non-seminoma. The CT scan is completely negative. The markers, norm markers normalized, but, and this is a big but, the conversation has to include the fact that we don't know that you are cured at this point. In fact, there's about a one in three chance that you're not cured. About 30% of patients are not cured with orchiectomy, and even when they have uh, no evidence of, of metastatic disease, they harbor, that percentage harbors occult or secret micrometastatic disease that if left untreated will ultimately progress and declare itself sooner or later. So for that reason, we offer the following three options. Retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, RPLMD, cisplatin-based chemotherapy, typically with BEP, or active surveillance. When I have given webinars and patient uh, presentations in the past, I often on my slide will draw a line through active surveillance because I feel so strongly about, uh, about how poor an, an option that is for people. This is not without controversy um, and this is not without disagreement. Um, it's my perspective. Um, we have to be as good as we can be in predicting who is likely to recur if placed on surveillance. And this gets back to what's in the primary um, and what's the stage? If there is a predominance of the embryonal carcinoma pattern, and this means more than 50, 60 percent, or and or if there's lymphovascular invasion, which makes it a T2, PT2, then one in two patients will recur. And for that reason, I think they're bad candidates for surveillance. If neither of those is present, then it goes down to about 15 percent who will recur. So that's where you get your 30% who are gonna recur. It's much more common in those who have embryonal carcinoma and who have lymphovascular invasion than if they have neither of those, i.e. a PT1 with a little bit of embryonal, maybe some yolk sac, maybe some teratoma thrown in there, maybe a little bit of seminoma, much less likely to recur, but it's 15%. 15% is significant, particularly in a demographic that's at the beginning of, beginning of life. And because recurrence is 30%, therefore, overall, in patients who are placed on surveillance, um, it's important to really make sure that they understand the, the treatment algorithm that they are undertaking. Um, the good news is that uh, if they choose surveillance and they're in that percent that's going to recur, treatment at the time of recurrence is virtually always curative. Not 100%, but virtually always curative. But 
And this is the big but, which bothers me when I talk to patients, the treatment burden is much higher. It's not just uh, one or two cycles of BEP or two cycles of EP, depending on who you read and what's kind of current in the literature, but it's always three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP, um, so they get more chemo and therefore more uh, morbidity from the chemo. And in those patients uh, in whom their metastatic mass in the erector peritoneum doesn't shrivel up and go mostly away, they get a post-chemo RPLND, which may be a, a fun, interesting, engaging surgery for us to do as surgeons, but of course it places the patient at greater risk. A post-chemo RPLND of a large mass that's stuck to surrounding tissues, the ureter, the, uh, the, uh, the sympathetic uh, nervous chain, um, other structures, uh, the duodenum, et cetera, is going to have a higher risk profile than a, a, a so-called stage one RPLND. So all this goes into the discussion when I talk to patients about whether surveillance is or isn't appropriate. Um, uh, if a patient chooses active surveillance uh, for his clinical stage one non-seminoma, um, the initial couple of years are the most important, of, of course. Median time to recurrence is six months, and so you get to the first six months, that's half your recurrences right there, obviously. Um, at two years, that's virtually all the recurrences, but there's a certain percent that recur after three years. And so for that reason, patients have to be followed long-term. Five years is what the NCCN recommends. Um, and of those recurrences, virtually all of them are the so-called good risk recurrences and therefore should respond pretty well to chemotherapy. So in summary, the main advantage of surveillance is that you avoid the risks of RPLND, you avoid the risks of, of chemo. The main challenge, in my view, is the risk of non-compliance, which is estimated at, you know, at, at a small 35% to a very high percent, depending on how you measure it. Um, this is the surveillance protocol. Um, also available on the NCCN uh, webpage is the current one for, uh, for 1As and 1Bs, which is uh, small versus larger primary tumors that are not PT2s, they're PT1s. And you can see here, it's a fair amount of CAT scans and markers and uh, chest x-rays, if you will, uh, visits to the doctor. And if you, if you map that out over the course of five years, there's just not a lot of guys who end up, um, who end up doing that. Um, this is my demographic challenge slide, um, and this is what I, what I when I speak to, to our trainees here, um, we talk about the fact that 24-year-olds who are status post orchiectomy or 19-year-olds or 31-year-olds, there's a lot of stuff they do. There's a lot of stuff they do. Coming back for a CT scan every three months for two years is not high on the list. And while you may be able to capture some of these people, it's hard to predict whether this is the patient who's gonna be compliant with surveillance or whether this is the bungee jumping dude is gonna be compliant with surveillance or him or him or him. So if you can figure out who's gonna be compliant with a surveillance program, great, then put patients on surveillance. But if you can't quite figure out who's gonna be this dude, um, then it's on you as the urologist or as the urologic oncologist to make sure that the patient stays on his, on his regimen. If you have one or two or three patients on a surveillance program, you can put it up on your squeegee board or a chalkboard in your office and you can keep really close track of them. Once you have 15 or 30 or 40 patients on surveillance over the course of different months and different years and someone missed this one but not that one and someone missed that one but not this one, um, it gets very difficult to keep, to keep track of. No one has yet developed an app that I'm aware of um, that allows the physician to, uh, to do a good job with this. And so just recognize that if a patient under your care chooses active surveillance, the demographic challenge of that pa managing that patient is on you. Okay, um, a little bit of research that's been done on compliance with active surveillance. This is a study published uh, by colleagues of mine a few years ago. Um, and you can see here, whether you, whether you wanna look at tumor markers, abdominal imaging or chest x-rays during years one, two, three, four, or five. And this, uh, this is based on a large data set, large, a large uh, secondary data set. You can see what the percentages are in this table. There's no, there's no 100 percentages in this table of patient people who are 100% compliant. Even if you look at people who are 50% compliant, you get people, who, you know, you get a lot of people who don't show back up for, the, for all the imaging. And then there's a very high percentage of people who never get one CT scan or one set of markers or one chest x-ray after they leave. And this is based on a national data set. So again, um, my, my plea is if you're gonna choose surveillance, make sure you, you're surveying the patient um, uh, with, with, with a fastidious approach. Okay, 
Um, I promise not too much on chemotherapy, but a little bit is important because th this is really, platinum really has changed the face of this disease over the last uh, 35, 40 years. Um, historically, testicular cancer was associated with a 50-50 mortality. Um, and with the introduction of uh, platinum in the, uh, in the 70, late 70s, um, everything, really, everything really changed. Um, so the standard regimen is bleomycin, etoposide, and platinum, BEP. Um, traditionally, it's given as three cycles. Um, the Indiana, uh, the, the folks at Indiana, Dr. Einhorn, et cetera, are fans of decreasing that to two cycles of, of BEP. Um, there are also is a lot of data uh, showing that if bleomycin is a particular risk of that for that patient, you can drop the bleo and add an extra cycle of the E and the P. Um, the NCCN and the EAU, which tend to be a little more progressive than the oncologists in the U.S., are currently recommending one cycle of BEP, so platinum and the bleo are so, are so effective with the atopis side. Um, <clears throat> uh, bleomycin uh, causes increased risk in patients, the occasional patient who's over 50, not very often, in heavy smokers, and if the creatinine is elevated. And patients who receive bleo have to be told that they, uh, they have to watch their risk of pulmonary toxicity in the future if ever undergoing elective surgery, uh, either sooner or later in life, because of the risk of overhydration, overoxygenation, um, et cetera. And they also, we also tell them not to scuba dive. Um, so it's occasional thing that comes up. Um, Short-term risks of uh, chemotherapy are not insignificant. I'm not gonna read all these out loud. You can see them here. They're also widely available on the, on the core curriculum slide set and in various other, various other places. The big one we think about with uh, BEP are the acute, the acute risks, such as hair loss, GI effects, uh, dropping their counts, et cetera. Those are managed pretty well today um, with some of the mitigating drugs. Um, but there's significant pulmonary capacity um, in a percentage of patients. And probably the big thing that makes a difference to people is the, is the neurotoxicity, either the ototoxicity with a, a hearing loss, which tends not to get better, or peripheral neuropathy, which can make a, an important difference for people depending on what their, what their work is. Um, longer term risks, uh, the risk of the side is thought to be associated with an increase later in life of certain leukemias, um, and that causes questions for people. And then you see the other ones here. There's a lot of attention to uh, coronary artery disease. Um, this is not very well studied, and so um, I don't usually quote that to patients, but it's in, it's in the literature, and you see, you see the other things uh, here. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's my, my view of chemotherapy and of surveillance. Now let's talk about RPLMD, and we'll talk about this for most of the rest of the, of the, of the time. Um, for those guys who have high-risk pathologic features, i.e. a high uh, percentage of embryonal carcinoma in the primary and or lymphovascular invasion, making it a T2 tumor or tunica albuginea invasion, making it a T2 tumor, or for those unlikely to comply with surveillance, which you know I feel is basically everybody in this group, um, node dissection offers a, a really good choice. Um, the advantages of node dissection are accurate pathological staging. <clears throat> if you do a full dissection, as you should, pretty low short-term and long-term morbidity if it's in experienced hands. The main risk being really, apart from the risks of the surgery, just the risk of either chylocytes, which is rare, uh, or the risk of retrograde ejaculation, about 15%. Um, so it gives you good staging, it's pretty low risk, um, it minimizes risk, the risk of relapse um, from, uh, from chemo-resistant germ cell carcinoma. In other words, if you have micrometastatic disease and you can cure it surgically, then you uh, decrease the risk of subsequently developing a chemo-resistant metastatic recurrence down the line. Um, and it also mitigates the risk of uh, having a growing teratoma because that's, because that's resected. Retroperitoneal relapse is rare down the line. If the patient is confirmed as having uh, N0 or pathologic stage uh, uh, N0 disease, um, or if there's low grade or low level stage two disease. So the, the follow-up regimen can be simplified in terms of how much, how much scanning and markers gets done <clears throat> um, uh, over time. Um, uh, low volume stage two uh, testicular cancer is thought to be one of the few conditions in oncology where a lymphadenectomy can actually be curative. <clears throat> Typically, we think of lymphadenectomies as being diagnostic. Think of bladder cancer, think of prostate, think of uh, urothelial carcinomas um, in the upper tract. But in, in uh, low volume stage 2A testicular cancers, it can actually be curative, and that's pretty well, well shown. And a surgical resection 
uh, relieves the risk of, uh, of chemotherapy for those patients. Um, if the RPLND is done properly, then relapse in that, in that site, in the rectal peritoneum, is very, very uncommon. <clears throat> um, in fact, relapse is uncommon anywhere because the tumor is thought to have to stop at the nose before going elsewhere. Um, and generally, as I mentioned before, these are good risk recurrences and they can be saved with, with chemotherapy. Surgical considerations. So as I mentioned before in passing, the natural flow of the lymphatic channels, this, this picture shows the sympathetic channels, but the natural flow of the lymphatic channels um, is such that tumors tend to go up on the right and cross over to the left, whereas tumors that start on the left tend to stay on the left, um, and that follows the venous drainage as well. But, but, the, but the main risk in doing an RPLND, whether it's open or laparoscopic, laparoscopic is the risk of retrograde ejaculation. Ejaculation, of course, being controlled by the uh, hypogastric plexus, plexus um, that, that is, uh, that is uh, fed by sympathetic, tr sympathetic trunks that come bilaterally. And you see here in this Netter diagram, the sympathetic trunks, the vena cava has been cut away so that you can see that the sympathetic trunks generally occur posterior to the vena cava on the right side and anterior to the aorta on the left side. And they all kind of coalesce down here around the area of the IMA. This is supposed to be the IMA over here and they coalesce right around the IMA, um, or right below it actually, and that's where the plexus is, and that's what, that's what gives you basically most of the sympathetic support for ejacu ejaculation. Um, it's important to mention to patients that the risk of retrograde ejaculation does not also, does not also confer a risk of uh, erectile dysfunction or problems with libido, et cetera. As I say, performance is no different, desire is no different, it's just that you fire blanks. Um, the, the semen can still be extracted from the urine after retrograde ejaculation for in vitro fertilization, but that's another conversation. We typically tell patients to store semen prior to an RPLND or prior to chemotherapy. Um, the general approach is this, and this is based on the open approach, which is how most of us train. I'll say a couple of things about uh, laparoscopic in, in a moment. Um, but we generally start, once we open the abdomen, um, it can be done through a, through a midline uh, incision, which is how I do it now, open. It can be done through a thoracoabdominal incision. It can be done trans transperitoneally. It can be done extraperitoneally, which is a very, very nice approach. The extraperitoneal can be done either through a midline or a paramedian. Um, or it can be done through a thoracoabdominal, which is how uh, many people in my generation train to, to do it. And with, with an extra perineal approach, the patient is in and out of the hospital in a couple of days. But the, the basic uh, surgical technique was developed as an open operation. Um, uh, if you do it through a midline, we start by dissecting lateral to the colon in the white line of, in the white line of tulk over there. Sorry. cable packet over here and the inter aorta cable packet over here. In fact, the lymph nodes are all one structure and they invest the great vessels. We make an incision where these two arrows are to do the so-called split and roll technique in order to create these three packets. And so you see here the inter aorta cable packet, the para cable packet, and the para aortic packet. And that's what we remove and we label after ligating and dividing a number of, uh, of uh, lumbar arteries and veins that get in the way. So we label them as three packets, but it's really all one, all one thing. So it's a little artificial the way we, the way we uh, label these, and that's, that's how it works. If you have a large tumor in this area, sometimes instead of just cutting through um, lymph node, uh, uh, benign lymph nodes right there, you've got to cut through tumor in order to use, this, use the split and roll technique. Important consideration surgically. These are the standard templates designed originally um, by Dr. Donahue at Indiana, um, and then subsequently uh, promoted by Dr. Ritchie at the, at the Brigham. Um, and these are what's called the modified templates. Uh, these are different from the standard bilateral template. The modified template goes from ureter to ureter, over here to over here, uh, above the IMA, all the way up to the renal vessels, and down to the IMA, you see the IMA coming off here, and then ipsilaterally down to the crossing of the ureter of the iliac vessels, 
if it's on the right side, right side, then it goes like that. And then the mirror image, if it's on the left side, it goes like that. The purpose of this is to preserve the contralateral sympathetic plexus tissue uh, in order to minimize the risk of retrograde ejaculation on the, on the other side. This works better uh, for a right-sided template than for a left, because on the left side, that's where the plexus mostly is, on the aortic side. Uh, over here and you're taking that, it works a little bit better on the right, um, but that's how, the, that's how the templates work. It is also very common, particularly in, in laparoscopic cases where the visualization is so good, um, but even in open cases with, with magnifying loops, to be able to dissect out the sympathetic um, fibers, or at least some of them, as they course through the lymphatic areas, particularly in a stage one case, and, uh, and, and, and preserve those in order to preserve integrate ejaculation. Um, now, let's talk, uh, let's move on from stage one and talk about stage, stage two, stage three tumors uh, in which there is a mass that is noted that continues after chemotherapy. So recall that if a patient is diagnosed with seminoma or non-seminoma and he has a metastatic mass, that that patient um, without fail goes for chemotherapy. BEP, typically, um, we talked about some of the other, um, some of the other alternatives to that. Um, but what happens if the mass doesn't go away? Well, we manage them slightly differently if the primary was a pure seminoma or if it was a mixed uh, non-seminoma. Uh, for a seminoma patient who has a mass after chemotherapy, we base it on the size of the mass um, and also on uh, PET-CT imaging. Um, viable tumor is very, very rare if the size of the mass is below two or three centimeters. This is the memorial criteria of three centimeters. And that's generally what we use, two to three centimeters. Um, or if the mass has shrunk down to 10%, of its original size, um, uh, it's very rare. However, if the mass is greater than two or three centimeters, then there's much higher risk of there being viable tumor present despite the patients having gone through chemotherapy. Um, fluoro, uh, PET C, 18 fluoro PET CT is helpful um, because uh, it will often light up as hot if the, if the mass contains viable uh, cancer cells. And if that's the case, we typically um, either go to salvage chemotherapy right then um, or occasionally we will, if it's, a, if it's a not too big a mass, we will um, either do a biopsy of it um, or occasionally we'll do a post-chemo or PLMD. In general, if there's an operation you want to stay away from, there are two of them in urology. One is a post-radiation prostatectomy, avoid those if you can, uh, and the other is a post-chemo or PLMD on a seminoma patient. Very, very difficult cases, um, typically because the mass is so tenaciously adherent to the great vessels, the ureters, and, and other structures in the, in the area. How about non-seminoma? Well, um, this is a more common thing that we see since they are um, not quite as sensitive to the chemo. Um, management of the patient with a post-chemotherapy mass when his primary was in a mixed non-seminoma, again, based on several factors, the location, uh, the size, and the timing, that is when the mass um, manifests itself. Historically, we used to teach that the, the, the breakdown of what was present in a post-chemotherapy mass and non-seminoma was going to be 20% active tumor, 40% teratoma, 40% fibrosis, 20-40-40. Um, more recent data suggests that the presence of active tumor, um, persistent active tumor, is actually lower, maybe down as low as 10%. This is Indiana data as well. Um, and the risk of teratoma being present, you see there, and then fibrosis is the most common. The larger the post-chemotherapy mass, the more likely it is to harbor teratoma, which needs to be managed surgically. What about outside the, peritone outside the retroperitoneum? Well, it gets in the lung, uh, in the liver, in the neck, in the mediastinum. Generally, those just get, those get resected. We don't generally do them as a combined procedure, certainly not in the neck or the mediastinum. Occasionally, if there's a lung mass um, that's on the left side, you can do a thoracal abdominal approach and thoracics can do it at the same time. Um, but typically, we do these uh, separately. If the mass is less than two centimeters, we leave it alone. If it's greater than two centimeters, we generally resect it uh, for presumed teratoma. If the patient is insistent or has challenges in getting to surgery, you can watch it closely. Um, if it's pure teratoma, it's going to grow. The bigger it gets, the more involved is the surgery, um, but, but that's one approach as, as well. It often comes up on standardized exams as to whether there is concordance or discordance in the pathology between the retroperitoneal mass and the lung mass or the liver mass, um, uh, et cetera, mediastinal mass, and they are typically not concordant. Um, the, the overall concordance rate is somewhere around 50%. And so in general, if you reset the, if you reset the um, abdomen, the retroperitoneal mass, 
in the abdomen that comes back um, all fibrosis and there's still a lung mass, we generally advise resecting the lung mass as, lung mass as well and not presuming it to be concordantly uh, fibrosis. When these masses are really small after chemotherapy, less than two centimeters, we leave them alone. Um, and then if you, and, but you watch them. And if they, if they recur, then you treat based on, generally based on when they recur. If they recur early, um, either with, uh, with markers or with growth of the mass, then they get to salvage chemotherapy, either with, with VI, VIP instead of VEP, or with TIP instead of VEP, um, or occasionally even with a transplant, with stem cell transplant. Uh, whereas if the recurrence on follow-up is more than two years, typically it's associated with teratoma and those need to get receptive because there's no chemo that treats that, no radiation that treats that. So a few pictures just to kind of finish out the uh, time and then we'll stop for questions. Um, in general, whether it's a seminoma or a non-seminoma, these things are really stuck. Sometimes you get lucky and you can, you know, get out in time for lunch, but in general, these things are really stuck. And you can just get a sense even just looking at this mass, man, that's going to be stuck. The mass is favorably located. It's down around the bifurcation of the IBC, um, just above the bifurcation of the aorta. So it's going to be pretty easy to get to. You're not going to struggle in the upper abdomen, even though the patient is a little bit thick here in terms of his BMI. Um, but the ureter's in there somewhere. Um, he's, not, he's not stented. You know, these things can be really stuck. So I have a little caption here as to how I sort of remember the case from my, from my archive my archive. So sometimes they're really stuck and you have to, you just have to be prepared to sort of roll up your sleeves as it were, and be there with the kittener and uh, the fine tip right angle, just dissecting millimeter by millimeter by millimeter, having a 4-0 proline, single arm, double arm proline on the field to fix little holes that you'll never really make in the cava or the aorta, um, et cetera. Uh, sometimes they're just hard to access. This is a patient of mine from uh, about three years ago who chose surveillance after a low risk uh, primary uh, mixed non-seminoma, and he showed back up three years later with this little thing right up, right up here. And he really, really, really did not want an RPLND. Um, but three years out, it was presumed to be teratoma. His markers were normal. Uh, it was presumed to be teratoma. He was, um, we get a lot of interesting types in Los Angeles. He was a, um, an underwear model and therefore didn't want an incision. Um, not that anyone wants an incision. Um, and so, um, I agreed to do it uh, laparoscopically, ro robotically, with the understanding that there was probably a 50-50 chance of, of recurrence. Um, but this actually, you can kind of get a sense, there's a bit of a fat plane around it. And because this was, there was no prior chemo, it wasn't stuck to anything. And so we went and got this one out, and um, he was in and out in a day. And he's, he's now um, a couple of years post-op from that, three years post-op from that. And, uh, and he, did, he did great. So sometimes they're stuck, sometimes they're hard to access, sometimes they're even harder to access. Um, than that. This is a patient who, on whom you can see from the surgical clips here that I did an RPL and beyond, respecting the template published by Dr. Donahue, published by my old chief, Dr. Ritchie, went right up to the, went right up to the renal vessels, and then sure enough, his recurrence ends up being above that. So you see it coronally here, and then you can see it over here um, in the, uh, the cross-sectional view. This is right at the level of the, um, of the superior mesenteric artery. Um, the little white coming across is the, uh, is the left renal vein uh, coming across from the cava over to the left kidney here. Um, so this mass actually, I asked the thoracic surgeon if he could approach it um, either through a VATS procedure or, or, thor or thor thoracoscopically or transthoracically, and that's how he's going to get it because it's really way up here. It's behind the crewer of the diaphragm. You see the crewer of the diaphragm here and here. So it's just not normally an area that we, that we go to, uh, but sure enough, they can be there. So sometimes they're really hard, sometimes they're even harder to access. Sometimes they're even harder to access than that. This one you see is even higher up. This also is a post-surgical patient of mine who recurred out of field. Uh, and there's, there's no way normally during an RPLND, a post-chemo RPLND, which is what this kid had, would you be up inside here. But there's a mass over here. You can also get a sense of another one over here that shows up better in a different view. Um, but also my colleague uh, from, thora from thoracic surgery has spoken to this patient about offering him uh, a transthoracic resection for this retrochural, retrochural disease. Um, but these can be really, really tough. So you gotta have a good vascular surgeon to work with and a good thoracic surgeon to work with as well. But these are teratomas and there's no chemo radiation for this. This has to be, has to be resected. Um, and sometimes they're just big. Um, <clears throat> and so this is an example of, uh, this is uh, an open case um, from a few years ago, and you can just, you get a sense. It's, it's kind of off the cava. Um, you see the cava kind of squished around it here, 
Um, but it's pretty massive. You don't even know where the aorta is in here. This is an example of a patient I mentioned before that when we do the split and roll technique, instead of just splitting and rolling through wispy little um, tissue, you're actually splitting and rolling through the, through the tumor itself. And, you know, five hours later, this is how it should look. Um, and this is, you know, this is the kind of um, a view that pulls a lot of people into urology as especially because you see the anatomy of the retroperitoneum so nicely. So they can be pretty big. They can be even bigger. Um, there's another patient of mine from a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, with an even bigger mass. And, you know, again, you can see the cava kind of squished over to the, to the right here. Uh, you don't really even know where the aorta is. If you look at it cross-sectionally, who knows where the ureters are and all this, but, you know, you got you to gotta do that. This is how it looked open. Um, uh, just pretty, pretty large. It's hard to get a sense of this until you're, unless you're actually in there. But this thing is pretty, pretty massive. You can see based on the, on this, on the size of the, uh, of the, uh, of the pickups here. Um, and then, you know, during the process of rolling it over, you can see the resident's hand very, very strongly with the lap pad rolling it over towards the patient's lap. Um, this is one of the biggest I've ever seen, and I, I show this because the patient was all, all um, cachectic from all the chemotherapy, and this is kind of just the, the side view. Of the mass, you know, kind of arising from his abdomen there. When we um, opened him up, you know, again, very, very large, very, very large mass, just enveloping everything here. And these things are just, you know, stuck, 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 stuck. But, you know, hopefully at the end, you've got the ureter dissected out, you've got the uh, aorta, the cava, the vessels, et cetera, and the mass is, the mass is gone. So this is, this is the biggest, except for this one, which was even more biggest. Um, and um, again, before and after, and actually, <laughs> sometimes they're really, really, really ginormous. This is a, um, this is a, a teratoma, uh, <clears throat> and they, they get really, really, really big. The, the teratomas tend not to be quite as stuck. The pure teratoma is not, as, quite, not, as, not quite as stuck, but you can see if you've, if, you've, um, if, you've, uh, if you've ever seen a mass like this, it, you know, it takes two hands and two elbows to get it out. Uh, you know, it's, pretty, it's pretty ginormous. Um, a slide on support and survivorship. There's lots and lots and lots available for patients, especially nowadays during, during the era of the, of the internet. Um, these are just some of the examples. You can find all these pretty easily with an with a, with a online search. Uh, but there's some really, really great organi organizations, um, the American Cancer Society in particular, um, and all kinds of apps and whatnot for, uh, for, for patients. Um, um, let me one slide about the future. Um, we pretty much know most everything about testicular cancer other than maybe the genetics of it. Um, the next thing to come down the pike, we think is a, a better biomarker um, based on microRNAs. Um, this is the one that's gonna come out first, we think, although it's only available for research at this point, um, which compared to HCG and AFP, and certainly compared to LDH, has a really, really great um, area under the curve. Um, in terms of predicting who has micro, microscopic metastatic disease or who has a recurrence. And so, and so this test alone may end up um, negating the need for any kind of imaging over, over time. There's a number of other uh, microRNA, microRNA biomarkers that are on deck um, that, that are associated with various uh, parts of the cell cycle, um, et cetera, uh, metabolic biomarkers, et cetera. And you know, we'll see, this is, kind of, this, is, this is where the future is in testicular cancer. Um, and this over here is probably the, the near future in testicular cancer. Um, and with that, I'll conclude and uh, uh, leave a few minutes for questions if there are any. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Litman. That was a great overview um, of testicular cancer. We do have a lot of great questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with some RPLND related questions. Um, a few people wanted to know if you could give your opinion on minimally invasive um, RPLND. Sure. Historically, uh, the uh, approach to minimally invasive RPLND was was um, was advocated by the laparoscopic surgeons, quote unquote, as opposed to the onco oncologic surgeons, uh, quote unquote. And the laparoscopic surgeons, the history of that in our field, really comes from from endourology and benign laparoscopy. And historically, the laparoscopic RPLNDs that were done didn't end up resecting or, or capturing as many lymph nodes as needed to be captured because it was more of a berry picking, cherry picking kind of an operation. And so they didn't get back behind the cava, back behind the aorta. And uh, many of us who do a lot of testicular cancer, um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, saw a whole lot of recurrences in patients who had had a quote unquote laparoscopic RPLND. Um, with the advancement of laparoscopic techniques and the advancement of robotic techniques, um, that has changed the game a lot. So you have um, robotic
robotic neurologic oncologist now, whereas previously the robotics and laparoscopy was the benign oncologist. And if you do a proper template and you don't get too squeamish about getting back behind the cava and the aorta, um, it's a perfectly fine operation with inexperienced hands. There's very little published on it. Um, there's a series from Hopkins from a few years ago. <clears throat> um, and there's another multi-institutional series, which, is, um, <clears throat> which, uh, which several of us participated in, which is in, in review right now. But in experienced hands, a robotic RPLND ends up being a really beautiful operation. There was some concern early on about atypical patterns of recurrence because of the pneumal peritoneum. That is, that is still a question, but not one that I believe is going to be borne out based on the available data. So that is a standard of what we offer people at UCLA for stage one as a robot-assisted RPLND. It's an overnight in the hospital, like all robotic cases, um, and they just understand that there's, a, you know, like any robotic case, there's a chance of having to, um, of having to, you know, to convert to open, to convert to open. And generally, it's better for the stage one case, but a really favorable um, recurrent case, um, we, we do those as well. Okay, great. Um, uh, a few people wanted to know if you routinely stent uh, ureters uh, prior to difficult cases. Yeah, not 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 routinely. Um, typically, the patients who are stented are stented because they had a stent placed because they had ureteral obstruction back during their chemo, and so they come to us stented. And if the stent's already in, we'll leave it in for sure. Um, it's always an option for us, and it's very easy to do for us in your in urology, um, but not not something we typically. Do. Okay. Um, for surveillance, uh, do you sometimes use MRI instead of CT to reduce radiation exposure? Yes, ab absolutely. The NCCN guidelines, as they've evolved over the years, tend to add MRI as an alternative to, to CT as well. So we do often use that. Patients often ask for that. Um, a few people also wanted to know uh, your opinion on PET scan uh, for residual mass after seminoma. A uh, few people have heard that maybe it's falling out of favor. And what is the role of biopsy? Yes, well, well, a PET CT after seminoma for recurrent mass or persistent mass after seminoma, that's the role for PET CT. It's not 100% specific, um, nor is it 100% sensitive, but we use that pretty routinely if we're, not, if, we're not sh if we're not sure. For example, seminomas typically don't have marker, occasionally a little bit of HCG, not usually in this setting though. Um, and so if there's a persistent mass, um, and the PET CT is equivocal. We'll start with the PET CT. If it's equivocal, then we do do biopsy. It's not uncommon to do a biopsy. The risk, of course, with that is sampling error. Um, and so very occasionally, I'll be sort of forced to go in and do an RPLND on a residual, on a residual mass. Typically, we don't use PET CT for non cellulomas um, a few people wanted to know about post orchiectomy biomarkers. Um, uh, if they're not going down according to their half-life kinetics, um, or in the situation that you mentioned that a patient has normal markers prior, but elevated after orchiectomy, how, how do you manage those two? Symptoms? Yeah, great. also a great question. This is why the marker, you have to be really meticulous about the markers. So the patient starts with an AFP of, you know, 67, and you measure it a week later, and it's 37 and you measure it a week later and it's 15, you know, it's dropping as you'd expect. But if it doesn't follow that, that pattern, that, that patient is presumed to have metastatic disease and he goes off to chemotherapy. Okay. And then the same thing for the, for the very rare patient who has normal markers pre-op, pre-orchiectomy, but then it slowly rises post-orchiectomy. That's because there's metastatic disease that, you know, that may not be recognized on the CT. Very uncommon situation but occasionally you will see that. But that patient goes to chemotherapy. Okay. Um, uh, for, the, for the workup, um, does it need to happen, I'm talking about uh, CT scan and chest x-ray, does it need to happen before orchiectomy? Um, and is oral contrast needed um, in addition to IV contrast? So my answer is no and yes. No, it doesn't have to ha happen before orchiectomy. In fact, typically I reserve it for post-orchiectomy. Um, because I need something to distract the patient for the week that it takes the pathology report to come back. So I typically will, will wait and order it after the orchiectomy is, is, uh, is, uh, is done. And, um, and uh, sorry, what was the second half of the question? Um, the, the, the second half of the question is if oral contrast is... Oh, so, sorry, pardon me. Yeah, yes, or, oral, oral and IV contrast. Yeah, you bet. Because otherwise it's hard to tell the duodenum and the other parts of the upper GI tract from, from possible tumor. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, people are wondering why the oral contrast was needed. Um, and uh, regarding uh, patients with T4 tumors and history of scrotal violation, um, how, how, do, how do you manage that? The classic management and the correct answer of, of the oral boards is to do a hemiscrotectomy. Um, I've been involved in, I think, one of those during my entire career is actually with Dr. Hendren at the Boston Children's many, many, many years ago. Um, and that's a, that's a really gruesome operation, I'll tell you. Um, more recently, people have managed those patients with a, kind of a wide excision of the scrotal scar. I think the current management, if patient were sent to me with that, is I just watch them very closely because our imaging is so good um, that it's, it's more of a historical thing. So, Okay. All right. Well, I think we are now out of time. It's 10, 10 a.m. Dr. Litwin, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, all of the questions that we haven't answered are going to be posted uh, online. And I just want to remind everybody to take the survey and we will see you all at 1010 for the next lecture. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you to our to our residents at our, at our sister institution, UC San Francisco, for doing a great job and, and coordinating all this and organizing this. And everybody stay safe and wash your hands. Thank you. Have a great day.